Brexit. Now remember, I'm as much a Joe Public in this as any, because I, 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 I'm just looking at it. I, yeah. I watched my whole career disintegrate on Sky News Live. <laughs> you know, I found out I was unemployed at about 4.30 on a Thursday afternoon. I was in my cabin in the back of my home trying to write my book. And then this, this statement comes out, uh, we're shutting down the paper. And like the first thing was, Jesus, that there's been a miscalculation on my part. But uh, what happened? We won't know what happened for another couple of years. It's going to take years to unravel this. Mm. A very dodgy relationship. Like Murdoch had so much power. I'm still, I'm still working for him. Uh, he's still paying me my wages. But um, he, the power they had was wrong. Like you had Gordon Brown getting up in the House of Commons, condemning, uh, condemning Rebecca Wade or Rebecca Brooks who was in the middle of all of this. Yeah. Um, although she told the Commons Committee that she wasn't, so maybe she'd tell them the truth, but I wouldn't believe a word she had to say. But uh, Brown came up and condemned her for interfering when she was editor of The Sun in his private life and the health of his son. His, one of his children had an ailment. Yeah. It has since been proved very quickly that the story came, did not come from any hacking or anything, it actually came from a legitimate source. And the guy came forward who told the paper about it. But the thing was, he was prepared to use that and say, right, screw them, they did this to me. But at the same time, having said all of that, he went to her wedding. He's been hobnobbing with Rupert Murdoch and James Murdoch and all these guys. So the relationship between the power structure in the UK, the heads of the police, Scotland Yard, the government, the opposition, and Rupert Murdoch, this is, like, this is real highbrow stuff, this is... This, like, we're all just mere minions, the rest of us. Mm. These guys, this was corruption at the absolute top. And it, nobody gives shit. Like, it was, it was, it, that was how rotten it was. But the other thing is that the problem is for the implications for journalism going forward are so, so profound, particularly in the UK. And whatever happens in the UK has an effect here. Tends to filter through here, yeah. But like, what they will do, the, 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 we, ref, we rejected a referendum in this country two weeks ago. And the referendum was that the government could go in and send an investigator into anybody's home. They want to investigate mm. certain people. Now, based on what we've just been discussing, thank God, <laughs> thank God that the majority of people said, no, can you imagine these people that we don't trust sending people in to shut you up, bring you in front of a committee and destroy your name without any recourse to the law or whatever. Um, and, but these people, what happened in the UK, the, in, in the UK, the Telegraph paid 200,000 or something huge like that for the, the doc, for the information on the expenses scandal. The politicians are now cracking the whip. They were kowtowed <coughs> and afraid. Like it was almost like Murdoch was the Joseph Goebbels yeah. in, in the UK, and they were afraid of them. They were suddenly and now like big brave men that they are. Like a prime minister, one of the most powerful countries in the world, afraid of a shit of a little Australian man. Why didn't they just take them on and say, I am not getting involved in that? I'm not playing your game. They all got sucked into this vortex together. Then it's the, the media, as we've already said, affects so much. Yeah, but now, now, the, now the problem is that they're going to turn it completely on its other side. Um, where the, U, the, go, the UK authorities are going to start, they're going to completely and utterly, and it's thanks to the people in the news of the world, and News International, that they undermined the whole, um, the whole faith in the, in the business yeah. of journalism. And gave an opportunity to the politicians who nobody trusts in the first place to undermine them and to control them. And that's, that's got very serious implications for everybody. In it Toronto. does, it does. One final question, then we'll hand it over to Q&A on the, the floor. Um, print media seems to be struggling. It's mm. kind of on its last legs. I mean, you and I were chatting yesterday and we admitted that we occasionally read a certain newspaper online. Right. Um, you know, and it's something I think everybody does mm. at, at one point or another. I mean, are we going to reach a point where we're going to be getting all of our information via the internet in one way or another? Well, I, I, the newspapers are, the newspaper trade is, and I think it's very sad, because I think newspapers have served society right across the free world exceptionally well. For hundreds of years. Hundreds of years. Yeah. And they're still serving the public exceptionally well. Because there is still nothing like this. If you see something in print, then it's solid. Remember, in like the United States, PR people used to use messages that were trying to send out about presidential candidates to use newspaper-type headlines, and yeah. Times Ro New Roman and stuff like that. Mm. 
uh, ink or pr print a typeface to give it authority because it had authority. There's still nothing like picking up a newspaper and getting the, the, the ink on your hands. Maybe that's because I'm a hack, but <laughs> to read a newspaper. I think it's very, very scary that we're going to go into 1984. Uh, George Orwell, Orwell syndrome, where people are, going to, people are going to get less and less news. People are going to be much, the news is going to be much more manipulated and exploited. Uh, like the scary thing about 90% of the American people or whatever, some huge scary statistic in the States about when people get their news from Fox. You know, they learn Muslims did everything wrong. It was yeah. the Muslims that done it. <laughs> the go, Muslims the done it, yeah. You know, and uh, so I, I, think it's, I think that could be scary, and I think that newspapers still would have a position to play in it. I don't know what's going on, but... That's there. all right, that's <laughs> Trying to get in on it. Yeah. Okay, we'll open it up to the floor. I think we're, um, we're at the top of the hour. So um, wave at me, somebody who's a question asker. <laughs> Who's going to ask? Where are we? Okay, I got a hand up the top there. Yeah, great. Do you want to stand up and shout out your question? <laughs> I can't hear you. Sorry. How do you feel when the criminals that you write about, people like Pierce Reed, end up dead? Pierce Reed. Uh, I didn't write really about Pierce Reed until he ended up dead because I couldn't name him at the time. Uh, Pierce Reed was a extremely violent uh, thug who terrorised the people of Clondalkin, uh, and he got himself. He was involved in a feud with another gang, and he was murdered. And when he was murdered, then famously, the people who murdered him were called the Freemans. <coughs> they went famously and painted the roof of the church where his funeral service was to take place. It's almost like a real a front to everybody that he couldn't be buried there. Yeah. So how do I feel about Pierce Reed? Pierce Reed is dead. Uh, when you, you're, you're writing about... <laughs> <laughs> That's a fairly definitive statement, right? When, you, when, you're write, when you're writing about these guys and you're writing about them over a period of time, do you feel that you build up some kind of a relationship? I mean, you, you wrote a huge amount about somebody like the General. Mm. Did you feel you had a relationship with him? Oh, yeah, but I, 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 I understand it. Actually, I probably would do the master's degree on Cahill because there were so many different dimensions to the whole thing. Because you, you can use all the sociological theory you want to control. He's it. The one, he's just one big sociological tome, you know. Indeed. You know, how he got involved in it, labelling theory, social uh, Darwinism, all that kind of stuff. You know, all the... You, you have a respect for them. Yeah? There's, there's, there are a number of criminals that I know that I genuinely have a bit of a grow for, in the sense that you can understand where they come from. But and, and going back to you know the social deprivation thing, you know yeah. people become criminals, <clears throat> and it's very important to say that that the whole social dem deprivation argument, I think, is very relevant. The people do become involved in crime because of social deprivation, because they see the rest of society through TV, and you watch TV, as you were telling me a story, that great story. That's yes. right, yeah. But the kid, had no, he decided consciously to get involved in crime. Yeah. And uh, because there was no light in the house, no heat in the house, he was watching television, they were talking, was it some... Friends, friends yeah. Friends, and look at the money these people have on the television. Yeah. And, stuff. and people do get involved in that. But you're sympathetic, and you do understand they've been brutalised and beaten, and, and things haven't been good at home, and... You know, and you can understand that, feel great sympathy for them, especially if you've had kids yourself, you know. And, but then your sympathy does send, tend to slip a bit when they take a sawn-off shotgun and ram it down your throat mm -hmm. in the middle of a robbery and tell you that they're going to take your money. And I've seen too many people, uh, as I say, Steve Collins is a very close friend of mine. Christine Campbell, the mother of Anthony Campbell, is a good friend of mine. Mrs. Gearn is, like me, de facto anti at this point. Yeah. Uh, John Hennessy, who they tried to murder over uh, Bible Salute. I've seen how all their lives have been affected. Another thing as well, by the way, which I am as well throw in, uh, when Steve, when Roy was murdered in 2009, the government hastily, and there's always an argument about hastily prepared legislation, so we have to see this new anti-gang legislation, whether it works or not. Um, it's been very, it's very controversial. I don't, I think it's actually going to fail the test in the courts. And that's why, thank God, we have a good court system, a good 
judiciary, uh, they will test it for us. But the, um, the Council for Civil Liberties uh, were very, very vociferously against this legislation. Yeah. But they went down to see Steve. Now, Steve Collins, his son three months earlier or less, had died in his arms. The power of the bullet was such that the bullet had gone right through his body and was lying on the ground. And Steve remembers feeling the bullet in his hand. Yeah. He got into the ambulance with his son, and, and, and he, like, I, I, I consider it an honor and a, and, a, and a privilege to say that he's a very close friend of mine, and I have great regard for him, because he's so strong, I couldn't do that. Mm. But the Council for Civil Liberties went over to see him in Limerick and sat down for three hours telling him why this legislation couldn't go ahead and why it was wrong and bad because of the criminals, the, 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 the civil liberties of the people it would affect who were effectively criminals. 